Okay. I'm all set. Oh, let me just grab something real quick. One second. No rush. All right. What'd you grab? Vanilla Coke. Oh, sorry. I just realized I need to grab something. Hold on. <laughs> okay. What did you grab? I grabbed a vanilla Huel. Oh, that's, that's the food thing, right? Yeah, it's the meal replacement thing. I, I was getting ready. I forgot to grab something. I knew it was something. And then it's like, oh, vanilla. Thank you for triggering it in my brain. What do you think of vanilla Huel? Uh, it's the best Huel. Okay, but are we grading on a curve here? Like, it's not as good as a vanilla shake, if that's what you're asking. Yeah. It tastes vanilla. It right. is a totally adequate meal replacement. Was there a competitor? I forget the other one. It was like Soylent? a... Soylent. Soylent, yes. It's definitely better than Soylent, I would say. And I think there's some weird thing with like Soylent not being able to be sold in the UK anymore. It seems like Huel is everywhere and Soylent has disappeared. Is this one of the ones I can't have? Like, is it full of nuts? Is it full of nuts? I don't know. <laughs> Just like with Soylent... I feel like the really unfortunate names is like Soylent. What's Soylent made out of? People. Yeah. It's like Huel. What's Huel? Human fuel. Human fuel. It's made of humans. It's, it's made of humans. Like, guys, why are you picking these names? These are terrible names. Like, looking at their website, it doesn't say it's got nuts in it, but they might have nuts in it. How are, how are you with peas? Are peas okay? I don't know. Are yeah, yeah. Nuts? Peas are great. Peas are awesome. It says on the here, like, just an image. I don't know why it's just an image. Tapioca, sunflower seeds, coconut, pea protein, flaxseed, and hemp seed protein. I think I should be good at that. Yeah, I'm not seeing anything on the one that I'm drinking that looks like nuts. Did Soylent have a lot of nuts? No, but a lot of like protein bars. Mm -hmm. They're just all it's all nuts. It's yeah, just it's all, all nuts. nuts. No matter what it tells you the flavor is, right? It's like chocolate chip, but like 70% peanuts. <laughs> it's like, oh. It's always funny to me when I see like chocolate chip and then like peanut chocolate chip. Mm. It's always peanut anyway. So like I don't, you know. Uh but I found I don't remember, but years ago like I found a company that that was their thing. Like we make protein bars without nuts in them. Mm -hmm. So the Huel, right? Does it fill you up? It totally acts as, as a meal replacement. Okay. I think the biggest disadvantage is it's it's higher in carbs than I would like. 26 carbohydrates per individual little drink. It's a bit high on the carb side if you're trying to do something that's keto to have more than one in a day. Mm. But this is, uh, shall we say, transitioning out of holiday eating mode. I have never eaten so much during the holiday break before. So we build a gingerbread house. Do you know, and I build a gingerbread house every year. Mm -hmm. It's like... I basically ate the entire gingerbread house, which is like not a thing that I do. Wow. Like usually it's like it's there and then we'll eat a little bit of it and it's gone. But like over the course of like a week... I ate most of the gingerbread house because mm -hmm. it was just like in the kitchen. And like every time I walked past it, I was like, well, I have another piece of gingerbread house. Like I was like Godzilla walking around the kitchen. You know what I mean? <laughs> the poor villagers must have been terrified of me. <laughs> well, I'm glad you were enjoying yourself. You know, like, yeah. that's very much the like Thanksgiving to New Year's season. <laughs> it's like, well, when can I physically not eat anymore? <laughs> Again, like I would love for the carbs to be like half of what they currently have, but compared to eating gigantic bowls of pasta for dinner, it's very <laughs> you know it's like oh we're already way ahead. It's like oh how many how many carbs per meal three weeks ago? I don't know a hundred two hundred carbs per meal. It's like okay, so twenty six is a great improvement. I like to make a recommendation for you for like a thing that I like, which is kind of in this vein. Mm -hmm. It's a cereal called Magic Spoon. Magic Spoon, okay. Yeah, they do, it's great. What I like about Magic Spoon is they do cereal that is like kids' cereal for adults. Hmm. No sugar, low carbs, high protein. I'll investigate it. And genuinely, it's really good. Now, like all of these things, it has like something weird about it. Like it's got like a little chalkiness to it sometimes, but the flavors are great. And of all of the stuff that I've tried, which is like, all of this for me is lunch replacement. That's always what I'm looking for. Because lunch is the most dangerous meal of the day for me, mm. for sure. And Magic Spoon has been my favorite of these that I've found. I might try these Huel things. I might get one of their sampler packs and give it a go. Because this would be the perfect kind of thing for me to have in the studio. I have a little fridge in the studio, right? And I could just stock these up and to maybe a couple of days a week, this is the, my lunch or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you're looking for a lunch replacement, 
for that, I highly recommend it. Okay. What I don't like about these kinds of things is like, why is it version 1.0, version (laughs) 2.0? I'm just going to speculate that gives you some insight into the background of the founders of the company. That's that's what that comes from. Like, oh, they probably came from tech slash software. Hmm. I'm going to take a look. Yeah, no, this is this is all part of the rollover from the theme of like, oh, there's two parts. And one of them is work on your health. Uh, this is definitely the like work on your health. Like, let's transition out of just terrible holiday eating. And like, mm. so far, so good. How is your theme going? Uh, it's probably worth setting the stage, by the way, that we set our themes eight weeks ago by the time we recorded. Yeah. <laughs> so like I have been living the year of the weekend for two months, even though it's January. I was pausing there for a second when you asked me because we do have this very strange time delay between when we last spoke and especially because we recorded the theme episode earlier this year. Way in advance. Way in advance. We recorded it like before I went on vacation in November. It was recorded a really long time ago Mm -hmm. because we wanted to make sure it was done. I didn't want to record it on vacation again this time like I did in 2020. Two, the beginning of 2022 yeah th- that was that was the day where you were going to disney after yeah. we were done re- i hated that right like i yeah. was nervous it was way too high you stress during, i was me. like no 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 we will never do this again like so we just i can't live with it. the pressure that like <laughs> mike has to go to disney so like we need to fit it like i was awful i was like i yeah, can't delay that man going idea. to disney that was awful. that was just it was a bad idea because then i was like <laughs> It was on my mind that I had to edit it mm-hmm. and I started editing it on in the airport on the way. It was just like a bad, bad time. So like this time, and I think we'll always do this, get it done before the holidays. Mm-hmm. It, for us, it's just a case of like planning. Mm-hmm. So like we're still running our themes for 12 months, but they're from like November to November rather than January to January or whatever, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I think also part of the reason I was kind of hesitating is, is I feel like ideally... December slash January, some period in there is like a vague transition from the previous year to the next year. And that's how I feel like it's Mm. gone for me is it's a bit like, oh, we did record forever ago, but I feel like mostly I've actually just started with the theme stuff two weeks ago because I was in a kind of transition period. Sort of a, a good way to finish the last year slash also start the year of work was I ended up doing a writing retreat. I'm fortunate enough to be invited to these things sometimes. And so those are always just like incredibly successful work periods. You're there with other people. You're focused on one thing. Everybody just ends up talking about whatever they're working on. And you sort of keep an eye on everybody else of like, hey, what are you doing over there? Shouldn't you be uh, working and not just sitting around? So it was really great, really focused period of time. It's just like gentle bullying. Yeah, it is. It's like friendly work bullying. But it's it's good though. Yeah, like I, I like that. Something that was different this year, which ended up being a great idea, was that we were all kind of, you know, like I always talk about in units of like doing units of work. Mm -hmm. Kind of got everybody to be centrally tracking like units of work done per day, basically right above the coffee machine, which is where everybody was going all the time. So that was also like a very nice, gentle pressure on everybody is like you could see where other people were in their day towards finishing however many units of work they wanted to get done. It was also a nice test of some of the stuff that I'd been thinking about how I want to pick and select topics. Some of the things I was working on were correctly constrained in terms of like how big can this project get or like how many things mm. am I working on at once. So it was it was really good. And that's why like that trip really felt like a big transition. It's like, oh, that was partly last year, but it was also the beginning of this year. The people on these writing retreats, are they all YouTubers or are they across different fields? Uh, it's different fields. Not everybody's a YouTuber. I think that's good. Yeah, yeah. That ma- I think that makes the most sense or something like that. If you can get a mix of professions. Yeah. The trick to those things working well is... It matters that everybody does the same kind of thing, but it doesn't matter that you're doing it in the same medium. Writing is writing, right? Whether you're writing a YouTube video or a TV show or a movie or a book, like you're still writing. When I get invited to these things, I do try to say yes. They always end up being just very productive periods of time, but they're also just incredibly draining because you can't maintain like the 10 days of just constant focus on the one thing at this high level for forever. Mm-hmm. But that's why it was it was nicely planned right before my Christmas break. And flying home, 
the whole airport was like a plague zone. <laughs> I don't know what was going on this year, but coming through that airport, I felt like I was in a horror film. Everywhere I listened, it was like coughs and sneezes. It's like Flumageddon, man. It's been yeah. like a, this, this holiday season seems to have been a bit of a nightmare. I, I feel pretty fortunate that I have escaped any kind of like even just sniffles uh-huh. because just it feels like everyone's sick with something. Right? Yeah. <laughs> it's bad. Yeah, it was it was real bad. And I was in that airport of like, I'm not getting out of here alive. <laughs> like, there's no way. And sure enough, I go 24 hours after getting home, I was like terribly sick for a couple of weeks with like a low grade flu, which I'm choosing to interpret as a final last thing from 2022. And that like yeah. closes the book on the terrible year of health. It's like a oh, one final thing is Christmas and New Year's was kind of very low key from being super sick. But yeah, so that aside, I'm pretty happy because I've been slow to getting back into work, but I've been, now that the holidays are officially over and I'm back to regular normal health, I've been sort of pushing hard on the like work on your health part of the theme. Mm -hmm. And that's partly why I was drinking the Huel now. It's like already lost a bunch of weight. I've been back into doing regular exercises, put on some muscle. And so like So far, it's actually quite a good start to the year. And I'm going to now, like, now that that has gotten started, going to slowly start ramping up the work side of things as well. So that's kind of my main report from the theme. But, oh, actually, one of the little things happened, which made me kind of think about how I think it's really good to have a theme to help guide your decisions. And I just had a moment happen a couple of hours before we started recording, which is that I got an invitation to a conference and it's funny because it's it's a conference that I had I had constantly been encouraging the runners up to be like, hey, you guys need to do that again. That was great. And let me know if you're ever thinking of doing it again. And so today I got that email like, hey, we're going to do it again. And for a moment, I was like, oh, man, I really want to go to this thing. And I felt kind of conflicted. But that like the theme came into my mind and it was like, hey, is this going to materially help you with the theme of year of work? Or is this actually going to be a hindrance in the year of work? And in that framing, it's like, man, this decision is a no-brainer. Sure, I've been wanting to go to this thing for years, but it just doesn't make sense. And it actually becomes really easy to make that decision of like, oh, I'm going to have to turn down this invitation. Like, I'm very sorry. But yeah, so I don't know. It felt like the theme has already saved me some time sort of going forward and making some decisions much easier about Now you have to turn down more invitations than you did last year. You have to limit the amount of travel. And so, yeah, this this is the theme helping to guide decisions. I'm still not going to say no to all invitations. Mm -hmm. I was was trying to think of like a rough rule. And I think my rule might be something like, if I have to change time zones, that's probably like a near automatic no. Right. With the slight asterisk of if it can work out that I can stay on gray master time while moving, like maybe that's still a yes. But yeah. So anyway, that's how I'm just thinking about stuff as the year started. It is funny where it's like, you should do this again. You should do this again. Come on, you should do it again. Okay. Well, I'm not coming. <laughs> I know. But you I should know. do it. I know. <laughs> I, I, like, I genuinely feel bad about that. I, 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 I'm sure I've even said words like, oh, if you do this again, I guarantee that I will go. Right. And it's like, oh. <laughs> this episode of cortex is brought to you by issue whether you work for yourself or you're part of a team it's time to get creative make your online presence and your business stand out from the rest with issue issue is the all-in-one platform to create and distribute beautiful digital content from marketing materials and magazines to catalogs and portfolios and so much more there's no need for endless scrolling through boring looking PDFs. Issue features your digital content in an easy to view way on every single device. Make it once and distribute it everywhere without reformatting. Your content is automatically optimized for engagement and ready to share, which saves you so much time. Issue also works seamlessly with the tools you're already using and loving, like Canva, Dropbox, MailChimp, and 
InDesign. I uploaded a presentation of some marketing materials that we're working on for Cortex Brand to issue, and it was super easy for me to set the privacy settings for who and how I want this presentation to be seen. It was really easy for me to be able to preview exactly how my content was going to look, and at the end of it gave me a super shareable version of this presentation that people could see without me needing to download or upload or share some file. It's all on the web and viewable on every single device, so it's super convenient for the people that you're sharing it with. Content on issue can be published as public or private. Private only allows users with the shared link to view it, which I think is great. And public content is available for your audience and it will be available for others to discover on the issue platform. This is super cool. The platform also provides statistics on how your content is being consumed so you can learn more about your audience with data and impressions, clicks on the content, duration spent reading, pages viewed, and so much more. So you're going to know what's working and the stuff that you're sharing. Issue helps creators, marketers, designers, and really anyone who wants to make content that stands out from the rest. Get started with Issue today for free or sign up for an annual premium account and get a huge 50% off when you sign up at issue.com slash podcast and use the promo code Cortex. That is I-S-S-U-U dot com slash podcast and use the promo code Cortex at checkout for your free starter account or 50% off an annual premium account. One more time, that is issue.com slash podcast and the promo code Cortex. Our thanks to Issue for their support of this show and Relay FM. How's your theme going so far, Mike? You know what? I'm very happy. I feel like I have so far picked the perfect theme for me this year. Oh, yeah? Well, one thing that happened, I guess, since we last recorded is I suffered two injuries, which is... I mean, really, I look at it as kind of hilarious. And, and Injuries are not hilarious, Mike. Well, I mean, it's like one of those things where you look back and it's just like, I can't believe this happened to me kind of thing. It's retroactively hilarious. I sprained my ankle pretty bad a couple of days before we took that vacation that I was talking about, which was very upsetting because it felt like that was finally my reward for what was overall a very bad year. Mm-hmm. And that just added on to it. But through the help of my wife and a mindset change and thinking about weekend, I had the best vacation I've ever had. Oh, fantastic. Great. Because I ended up prioritizing relaxation and recovery. Oh, good, good. And so we just basically did really nothing, just like really just relaxed, enjoyed ourselves, you know, sat by the pool, ate good food, like that kind of thing, which was, mm-hmm. it was so needed and so wonderful. So that felt really good. Then, because of the ankle sprain, I wasn't working out, and then I think that weakened and exacerbated an existing injury that I have in my back, because I went back to the gym and immediately threw my back out like three days before Christmas, which is <laughs> which is a thing I'm still dealing with now, and I think is going to be around for a while, mm. but in these situations, they are very frustrating but the idea of the year of weekend is about like rest is like a big element of it. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. so this mindset is helping me take the rest that I've needed in certain areas to pull me through emotionally to very frustrating things that have occurred. Mm. So that was like just good to have that in my mind. So I was honestly very happy about when we recorded that episode because it was like perfect. It was like, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Two days before I did, I ended up spraining my ankle. But me and right. you were texting over the break a bit because I had found out you were sick and you had found out about my back through our wives. Mm-hmm. And I think I texted you on Christmas Day and was said like, that I feel bad for you, but at least it's like one last thing into 2022 about being sick before 23 mm-hmm. starts, right? That's what we were talking about, which is just kind of like a funny way to look at it. Just, just tuck it all in to 2022. Mm-hmm. And forget about it. Yeah, yeah. It all it all counts as twenty twenty two. And now that's the past. That's the past. The past doesn't exist. The past isn't real. So mm-hmm. it's you know poof away away it went, on to twenty twenty three. So my fitness for twenty twenty three is going to change a little bit as okay. I'm now like having to think about the midterm of the back recovery. And I've seen mm-hmm. a specialist and gone through that whole thing and you know that that's just a thing i'm now gonna have to start dealing with again which is fine Mm. i've done it before i'll work on it but i've already started making lots of decisions about the way that i'm spending time and it's lots of small decisions that i think add up to bigger effect so you know one is i leave for the studio a little later in the morning a lot of this is about 
getting rid of kind of like wasting time, mm-hmm. you know? So like, even if it is the case of just like, I stay home and hang out, you know, I stay home and play video game, like, but just there being more time at home, less time at work and kind of like further trying to separate those things and create that structure. And then similarly, when I'm done for the day, leaving, like mm-hmm. not just like hanging around and finding other little things to do. And this is also in conjunction with scheduling changes and trying to group more things together. So it's less of one thing at the studio days, you know? Hmm. If I've got one thing, I'll make sure that if I've got something else coming up, I'm also going to slot it in that day. Not perfect on this yet, and it's going to take work, persistence, and difficult decisions. There are going to be things that I'll turn down, or I ne- I will need to be difficult with people, that kind of thing. <laughs> hmm. And one of the things that I'm starting to realize and I'm working through is like, Most of the people that I work with, the difficulty can be harder on me because of time. An afternoon recording for one of my American co-hosts is an evening recording for me. Yeah, yeah. And that is harder for me than it would be if I could record it in the afternoon, right? So I'm needing to kind of try and be real with myself about some of the things that I'm taking on, that it is more difficult and I don't like working late anymore. So Mm. like this is part of why... I'm needing to be a little bit more tricky about some of the things that I'm saying yes to. You know, the key of the year of the weekend is taking weekends. And I have been making very conscious choices about how I spend them. Like I have a task in Todoist every Thursday that's like, what's your weekend? Do you have a full Saturday and Sunday? Mm -hmm. Are you going to be working on one of those days? If you are, what will you be doing next week to make up for that time? That's been really good because it's just making me think about it. And the whole thinking about it thing is like the mindset change has been really great. So I'm valuing my rest time more, considering it as a important thing because it is part of my themes. Like I should be doing this. This is the year of the weekend. Right, right. Like this is the same mindset as with the year of structure where it was about having structure to allow for unstructured time. So like playing video games instead of just like hanging out at my desk and not really doing anything was a good thing. And that reframing mm. was great for me. And this is a similar thing. Not working on the weekend is what I'm supposed to be doing. So it's a tick in the column where previously it had been, oh, I should probably get some work done if I'm just going to be hanging out. Mm. So it's like rearrange For me, it's like rearranging what's most important. And so that's been good. So yeah, I've been, I've been pretty... I've been feeling pretty good about it. I'm excited for the rest of the year under this kind of banner. Mm. But I am aware that, kind of like you, it's going to take a lot of decision-making all the time to make it stick. But yeah, I'm happy with the results so far. The one thing I've added to my little checklist, which I don't know if, the, if this works for you, because we do have these weirdly aligned themes just in, in opposite ways. But the day before one of my weekend days, I've added a little checklist item now, which is just to think about what the weekend might be tomorrow. This is to try to increase the probability of the wife outside time. Mm. If we think about it the day before what we might do, it wildly increases the chance of thing actually happens on day. Interesting. And so already we've we've like gone out more so far than we have in the past just with weekends of like thinking about okay, what might be a thing that we do that it counts as outside time? And it's also funny, I know, like, when I mention sometimes about, like, time tracking with my wife and, like, wife outside time, people always want to know, they're like, what does your wife think about that? And I'll tell you, she loves the idea of wife outside time. Like, she's totally thrilled and on board with, like, oh, hey, how can we make this timer tick up, right? So I think sometimes people imagine they're like, oh, God, that sounds so horrible. But it's it's actually it's the reverse. It's a way to like express importance from yeah. from my perspective of like, no, this is important. I should look at the timer and see that this timer has been going up relative to other things. But yeah, so it, like, how do you turn that into an actionable item? And this is one of my little things. Is just like just on the checklist, just think about it for a second, and even just that gentle reminder makes it way more likely. Like, oh, okay, well, you know, we're going to go outside today to some place, or even just like, oh, there's some couple errand that we need to run. Let's just do that tomorrow, and instead of 
is that what can very easily happen on the weekends. Like you just kind of wake up and the day slowly slides past from both of you. Mm. That's the attempt to try to decrease the number of times that occurs. Yeah, I think I could maybe add this into my Thursday thing. It's a little bit sooner, but like, you know, not just like, are you taking the weekend, but what are you going to do with it? Yeah, I, I find that framing is somehow more helpful than just like, oh, it's the weekend. It is that framing of like, what might happen tomorrow or what do you plan on having happen tomorrow? At least so far, it slightly changes it in my brain. As with all this stuff, with like health stuff and everything else, it is always kind of easier in the beginning of the year, but it's just a question of like, okay, what works and what can stick and what helps remind you of different things? Do you have any idea of the kinds of things that you want to do with your weekends this year? Well, I mean, there is the house stuff, right? So like that's- Oh God, the house. (laughs) Home projects are part of it. That can suck up a year. I think for me, especially on the non-weekend weekend days- I think would be good times to arrange activities with friends, especially those friends that I have that have more flexible working times, which I do. Mm -hmm. But even then it's like, because one of my biggest issues is for my friends that have regular jobs here, they do nine to fives. I never have evenings free. Mm. So like if we want to go out and get a drink or a meal or whatever, I'm always oh, I can't do it. And like, so that's something else I've been thinking about. In these days that I'm taking as weekend days, it's not just the regular daytime. It also means that evening could be free as well. So Hmm. this is something that I, this is going to take a lot of work and focus from me on like doing this. And I want to be for, you know, in a lot of my friend situations, someone who is pushing and like making the plans happen. But that's something I'm not naturally good at. So that is a muscle I need to strengthen. Yeah, I have have no ability to help you there. (laughs) Oh, I know. Well, it's why me and you so seldom see each other is because we are both very bad at this. Yeah, we're really bad at this. But so your idea is you want to try to be more proactive about that for Mm -hmm. like you be the person who causes things to happen. That's the hope. Yeah. I don't know if this is really true, but I do have the perception that a lot of social groups exist because there is just one person who is the person who makes the thing happen. Yeah. That often really seems to be the case. That like there's a person who is the driving person behind each little social group. Mm-hmm. If you have any tips and tricks in that area, do let me know, Mike. <laughs> for being a friend. <laughs> yeah, for being a friend, you know. I'll, I'll let you know. When I work it out, I'll let you know. <laughs> Got a bunch of follow up a lot of little things yeah. have been happening. It's been two months. Of course, there's going to be a lot to talk about. Lots of little things, and I want to talk to you about them. One is, got an awesome new Roomba. Ooh, new Roomba. Yeah. It's like the Roomba of my dreams. Okay, let me check it out. It's called the Roomba Combo. Roomba Combo. Okay. It vacuums and mops. Oh, intriguing. Now, it is not as advanced as their, like, because iRobot, the Roomba company, have a mopping robot right mm-hmm. which i don't know if you've seen it. it's like a full-on sprays water out cleans up after itself like this the, the the roomba combo has a mopping pad that follows the roomba basically like it's behind it as it's moving around hmm. but it has liquid in it so the the roomba will vacuum but as it's moving forward leaves a trail of liquid behind it and then mops it up afterwards and you can put like a cleaning solution in it but what makes this Roomba combo so good, and you know, I was watching some reviews of these things. There's a great YouTube channel called, I think it's called Vacuum Wars. <laughs> it's so good. My friend Tom, like Thomas Studio Neat turned me onto this. It's like, it is an incredible YouTube channel. The guy just reviews all the vacuums. It just it's just like very good. As always, like my first reaction is like, how can that possibly be? And then it's like, ah, the pen show, right? Every Everything yeah. is a world unto itself. I mean, Vacuum Wars has 266,000 subscribers <laughs> and gets between 10 to 200,000 views on videos. Because it's like, I love it. I love this it. This is the person who knows all the vacuums. Like, they have all these testing environments that they set mm-hmm. up, right? Like, they have these boxes and he sprays different types of like food down and like mm-hmm. watches them. It's very good. But the, the Roomba combo, one of the things that makes the Roomba combo good, because there are other robots that do this, like joint thing, is the mopping pad can be lifted and lowered mm. for when there's carpets or rugs. And this is combined with, great. I don't know 
how old your Roomba is now? My Roomba is pretty old. My Roomba is like five years old or whatever. Yeah, no, my, my Roomba is due for a soul transfer soon. So I've got my I've got my eye on these things. Yeah, the Roombas have gotten so good because now they have cameras in them, mm-hmm. and this camera and it has a light on it too, so it lights its way. I, I was like, it has a little flashlight. I just saw yep. that. It lights its way. And goes out and like they have brains in them now, right? And they like one of the things that I'm so impressed with. Well, I have a bunch of things I'm impressed with. It's like one, it detects the the rugs and you know knows where the rugs are, so it won't mop the rug. It does not bump into stuff as much. Hmm. One of the things that was always so funny is uh, our old Roomba Robbie, when cleaning around the dining table, it was just a nightmare. Bang, 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 bang. Every chair, everything. Rambo, the new Roomba, mm-hmm. doesn't bump into the table. Because mm. it knows it's there, and it also does all this stuff where, like, again, Robbie expected that all the rooms never changed, mm-hmm. and if anything changed, he'd get a bit confused. Where Rambo expects things to change, mm. and so like has the map, but is willing to see what's going on, and like if something changes in the room, it's not like he doesn't clean that area. Like he can see something's changed in the room, and we'll go around and clean it. And now as well, once he finishes the job, sends you a report and the report has pictures in it of like, what is this obstacle? Like, mm. is this a permanent obstacle? Oh, I see. Okay. So it's asking you like, yeah. hey, I ran into a thing. What is this thing? Interesting. Including cables. Hmm. So Rambo does not chew up cables like Robbie used to. Yeah. And like recognizes the cables and is like... What's going on here? Also, something... This might be good for you. I don't know. Probably you wouldn't need it, but it's for pet people. They have seem to have done so much work on detecting animal droppings. None of the dogs who stay with us I know that, do that any, in the Grey household, this that. could that's never not, be a problem. How, that and never how that works. Yeah. They are very well trained. We clean their paws before mm-hmm. they can come back in the house. It's a whole routine. The cleanest dogs in England. <laughs> I've seen the cleaning. I've seen I've seen the dog cleaning off the walks. It's it's very intense. But these Roombas empty themselves, which is so good. Hmm. Old Roomba, old Robbie, we had to empty him. But they have these bases which have an extra vacuum in them, right? And it mm. apparently it can do like six it can like empty it like sixty times or something before you would need to empty the base. Hmm. which is also very good. Um, And then you can also do the, you know, it will do a map of the floor plan. And then in the app, you can delineate rooms, even if it's an open floor plan, like make zones and name those zones. So then you could say, go and clean the kitchen. You'll drive out, clean the kitchen, go back. I can't believe how much better these products have gotten in the last five years or whatever. It's kind of incredible. Like the leaps, the difference between Rambo and Rob, like I love Robbie, you know, he's part mm. of the family. Robbie's not going anywhere. He's going to go upstairs, right? And Robbie's going to do upstairs. <laughs> but Rambo is like, he's got a big brain going mm. on in there. He's, he's a smart guy. Yeah, no, it looks, it looks interesting. I, th- I think the test that I would want to do is we don't really have to worry about the pet accidents, mm-hmm. but the pet toys are the big problem. And like one of our dog guests was very sad because his bone had disappeared the other day. And it's like, oh, I found it in Roomba, right? It's like Roomba had right. sucked it up. Oh, this is where your bone went. I'm so sorry. Here's a brand new one. It, you know, I've seen in, in the Vacuum Wars video, like it's not perfect, right? Like mm. it will grab things, but it seemed very good. Like he was doing it with toys and stuff. And most of the time it's like going around them. So. Yeah, that's what, that's what I'm curious about. Yeah, I don't know. I have to I have to put this on the consider list. I think that base for us is a little bit tricky because we don't have a great spot for a base. You don't have to do that. Oh, is that optional? Yeah, it's optional. It's it's an optional uh, additional purchase. Oh, okay. I thought that because uh, whatever it was, their last one had a base, but like it wasn't optional. It had to it had to work with it. But if there's a not base option, I might then we might consider that. Yeah, I believe you just get a you can get one. It's just a regular charging base, not hmm. the like big vacuum charging base one of the things we absolutely love is when it's Roomba's time to vacuum we have ours just perfectly hidden right under this little cabinet in the kitchen that is just Mm -hmm. barely taller than he is so like it is so cute to watch him like back up and come out and be and then like go back in after he's done it is it is never not funny to watch like we just you know can't not look at it for a second uh, but that's partly just a space constraint that we just don't have anywhere to put a real mm-hmm. base like that in the house. So yeah, that's, the, that's interesting. 
so you can the one I have is the J seven combo, mm-hmm. but the difference is one has the bass and one doesn't. Ah, I've got yeah, I've got to think about it. It might be it might be time for uh, Roomba upgrade. This this looks very interesting. I wanted to ask you if you had played around with Obsidian Canvas. Oh no! Uh, I so I saw that this came out. I think this is this is for anybody who's listening and uses Obsidian. This might be an interesting tool to try. This this looks like a bit of a bit like some of the tools that you use uh, sometimes. Of just like mm-hmm. you have a more flexible workspace where you can connect a bunch of different text boxes and images with, with lines. It's just like a digital whiteboard is the way yep. it looks like. But what I like about the look of this, so I've been eyeing this gray. This is the first time. No, wait, wait I've, a minute. What, this do, what do you is mean the you've been first eyeing time this? Okay, I have ever looked at Obsidian and could see myself there. Oh my God, that's <laughs> no way, really? Because what I like about it is you can have all of your notes as mm-hmm. you do, right? And they can be whatever. But then you can create these boards that are visual representations of things, which could include web pages and images and videos, but also the notes embedded in the page. Mm-hmm. And there's just something about that where I'm like, that works how my brain works. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I've had the web page open for a while and I have yet to dive in. Hmm. But I've been wondering if like this could be something for me. This could do what I'm using craft for, right? Anyway. Yeah, yeah. But could also give me this additional thing, which is this like rather than having like a folder of notes. So let me give you an example, right? So hmm. one of the things that I will deal with, so like say with the theme system journal, right? I have a whole folder of notes for the journal. But if I'm planning something new, right? Like let's imagine that when I did the new layout, the 2.0 layout, right? Which is what's in there now. I had my drawings and then I had manufacturer's information. Then I had pricing information and all that kind of stuff. Now I could imagine having a like 2.0 board that had all of that just visible in one place and I like that instead of looking at just like a list of notes in a folder, I could just see them all. So like right. I could need one piece of information. I got it here. I got another piece of information there. Like it seems really intriguing to me. I mean, I'll just also just point out that presuming that it works in Dropbox, which I imagine it does, you could have limited sharing with somebody else for some of these if that's mm. a thing that you wanted to do. Yeah, it's, it's funny. I didn't really think about you using it. I, I looked at it and I thought about you just in the sense of oh this is this is like the tool that mike likes to use a kind of virtual whiteboard and i can told like i can 100 percent see why lots of people are interested in this which is why if you've heard me talk about obsidian i think it might be interesting for anyone to just go look at this tool and see if it might be something that you want to use but i, I literally haven't opened it or tried it on my obsidian install because this kind of thing just isn't for me this is not the way my brain wants to organize information yeah i'm much more like the thing that i want and that i I think the the maximum version of this which obsidian does but it's like the rome research version of this where you have a kind of everything is a bullet point in a list and you can like indent out dent or like open and close different levels of that bullet pointed list that's what i use obsidian for and that's always kind of the way my brain works is like i want to have this and the arranging things in arbitrary space on a whiteboard it just has never really worked for me Mm -hmm. but i do think it's a very smart move by the obsidian developers to add this other tool oh now they must capture like 95 percent of the way people want to organize random notes you fall into these two camps do you want it more visual or do you want it more just purely text-based? I mean, look, I'll just say, Mike, if you ever want to play around with Obsidian, I am more than happy to help you get set up with it, if that's a thing that you want to do. Maybe, actually. Because I, the re- only reason, because it's been out for a while in the beta, at least, I think it might be in the shipping version now, since I first looked at it. It is in the shipping version okay. now. It's, it's released in the shipping version now. Because this went in, again, how long it's been, this is went into my show notes document when they had it in like their first kind of open preview of it. Yeah, I only found out about it through the uh, changelog updates to right. the shipping version. And, okay. like, and with Obsidian, I'm like, please give me the stable only branch. This is not I the time to that. use your beta yeah. software. Yeah. But like, I'm just, I feel quite intimidated about starting. Yeah, you're not wrong to because Obsidian is like a real big thing to just 
open and go look at just a ton of those options. So I'm happy to hold your hand through the Obsidian mm. setup and guide you to just the relevant things to whatever it is you're trying to accomplish. That is a very in- intriguing prospect to me. I'm going to put a pin in that one. I want to come back Ooh. to that. Because <laughs> I-, I need a guide and then I'll be fine. <laughs> I will be your Obsidian guide. This episode is brought to you by FitBod. Hey, it's a new year. Typically a time many of us are thinking about changing up our fitness plans. Maybe you have fitness as part of your yearly theme. So I'm super pleased to let you know that FitBod is both an easy and affordable way to build a fitness plan just for you. FitBot has a really smart algorithm built into the awesome app that learns about you, your goals, and your training ability. This is going to create a custom dynamic program based on your experience and any equipment that you have, all in their app, making it incredibly easy to learn how to perform every single exercise. Personal fitness isn't about competing with other people. Don't look to others and try to do what they do. You need something that's going to work just for you because that's when it sticks and you're going to see the results that you're looking for. Everybody has their own fitness path, which is why FitBod uses data to make sure they customize things to suit you exactly. They have powerful technology to understand your strength training ability. It studies your past workouts and then adapts to your available gym equipment. And your training plan will maximize fitness gains by intelligently varying intensity and volume between sessions. Because overworking some muscles while underworking others can negatively impact results, which is why FitBod tracks your muscle fatigue and recovery to design a well-balanced workout routine. The FitBod app is so simple to use with over 1,400 HD video tutorials shot from multiple angles to make sure that learning every exercise is a breeze. I find this to be so important, so I make sure that I'm feeling confident in the new exercises that I'm trying out. FitBod also integrates with Apple Watch, Wear OS smartwatches, and apps like Strava, Fitbit, and Apple Health. Personalized training of this quality can be expensive, but FitBod is just $12.99 a month or $79.99 a year. But you can get 25% off your membership by signing up at fitbod.me slash cortex. So go now and get your customized fitness plan at fitbod.me slash cortex. And you will get 25% off your membership when you do fitbod.me slash cortex for 25% off. Our thanks to FitBod for their support of this show and Relay FM. We had mentioned the pens that we collaborate with the aforementioned Studio Neat on, the Mark 1 pens. Oh, yeah, yeah. We mentioned them before. They weren't in stock. They are in stock now. So if you go to cortexmerch.com, we have a small number and we're ordering more. I'm hoping to try and keep them more in stock now. So if you heard us mention it, and we, mm-hmm. you heard us say we don't have any, none to sell you. Uh, we do currently have some <laughs> to sell you. So you can go to cortexmerch.com and you can see it there. Well, you should be able to. Again, the numbers are always limited. But as of right now, we have them. I, I was just trying to remember, like, wait, why did we mention that we have pens that you couldn't buy at the time? But it was the theme episode. We, yes. we were reviewing, like, what had been going on and talking about, oh, we have this product that we never talk about because it's very hard to keep it in stock. Mm-hmm. We were just having that as part of the theme review of the year. But yes, I love these pens. And we definitely still are in that difficult to keep in stock phase with it a bit like we were with the journal years ago so Mm -hmm. go check it out right now at cortexmerch.com limited numbers hopefully slightly less limited this time but uh yeah we'll see how it goes i have some scripts for you what do you mean you have a script for me i have asked chat gpt oh no to write three cold opens for the show (sighs) i mean am i how can you how can you just jump into something like this? <laughs> you don't even you don't even want to tell the people what Chat GPT is. I can't, <laughs> right? Like I don't think I have the ability to do that. I don't have the words. Maybe you have the words. I don't have them. Okay, wait. Before 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 you talk about the script, uh-huh. I went back and I listened to the last sort of in time episode we did, which is two episodes ago, before the themes episode, before the state of the apps when we were just having a regular Cortex and talking in October. We both made a joke at the end about how we had two episodes about AI art in a row and like how fast and suddenly all of this thing was coming online. And at the end of that episode, we realized, oh, we won't be able to have an in-time episode until January. And we were like, oh my God, what on earth is going to happen between now and January? And I feel like, man, we did not have any idea what was going to happen. I literally think what happened was like 
day zero for the whole of the internet suddenly becoming aware that AI is really a thing. It was early December. This tool called ChatGPT was released, which is like an AI chatbot that you can talk to. And this is the thing that I'd said it many times during our AI art episodes, where I kept talking about how like the AI art is cool, the language models are scary, but it was always kind of hard, like I was just saying a thing because I had seen private demos behind the scenes about some of this stuff. And it's a bit hard in that scenario to like try to convince people. Uh, but it was like, oh no, like the language models are now very public and people can play with them and talk to them and see what they can do. And I happened to be at home with my parents the day it came out. Boy, was that an interesting day on the internet. And I like I was showing my parents this kind of tech demo of like, look, there's this thing you can talk to and it will respond in very smart ways that you wouldn't expect. You can mm -hmm. ask questions of it and it can give you answers. You can ask it to do all sorts of tasks and it can complete them. So yeah, ChatGPT is like the first public facing, actually useful in some circumstances, language model that people can play and test with and see. So that's the background just in case someone hasn't heard about it and hasn't messed around with it. So so now tell me, what did you ask ChatGPT to do in terms of a script? What I wanted it to do was to give us a cold open intro for the episode. So the thing that happens before the doodling, you know, mm -hmm. which very frequently in the show's history has had some kind of conversation about microphone issues. Well, yeah. So I asked it for prompts in these areas. One of them was write a cold open intro for the Cortex podcast featuring CGP Gray and Mike Hurley. Ensure there is some conversation about issues with microphone setups. Mm -hmm. That was the first one. I had to, like, this is, well, this wasn't the first one. I asked it a couple of things before and it kept t talking about brains. So I had to kind of like, <laughs> kind of like bring it around again. Do you want to read through these as the AI has written them? Well, I don't know because I, f I feel like the one I'm looking at that you have in the show notes uh -huh. is just not very good because well, what that's what I that's why I, I, so I have three. I think these three differ in their goodness. Okay, so here's here's the first one. Uh, so Mike and I will be performing our roles <laughs> as written for us by yeah. GPT. Begin scene. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Cortex. I'm CGP Gray, and with me as always is Mike Hurley. Hey there, happy to be here as always. But man, I had a bit of a nightmare setting up my microphone today. My computer seemed to be having some issues, and I wasn't getting any sound on my end. Oh no, that sounds frustrating. I know I've had my fair share of microphone issues in the past. It's always a bit of a hassle to get everything right. Yeah, it can be a real pain. But we're finally all set up and ready to go. So let's dive into today's topic. Sounds good to me. Let's get started. Intro music fades out. End scene. Mm -hmm. That's bad because it's just extremely generic. Extremely generic. Well, one thing, ChatGPT doesn't know who would be most likely to have the issues. In ChatGPT's world, I have a problem, which never happens. Yeah, never, never happens. Never Mike. happens. It never happens. Tell okay. me when it happened. Uh, I, I feel like it happened off microphone. It, it, we just never have been able to capture it live. That's why that's we're having this memory. Okay. I think that's the way it worked. Okay. Also, we'll just pause here for a second because, well, maybe we'll talk about it later. But ChatGPT has some weird limitations on it, and one of these things is like they've limited how much it knows about the current world. And I think there's there's just an interesting question of like, does it know what the Cortex podcast even is? So that's why I feel like this is a hard one because it might not have any concept of the Cortex podcast. It does. There, oh, it there's does. been okay. some some ways that I asked this question, they just weren't very interesting. Mm -hmm. They were using words from our show description ah. and episode descriptions to talk about what Cortex was. So like productivity show we're gonna actually one of them does have it so like you'll hear it in the third example okay that it, you know it feels like it's just googled cortex but like at least it is aware of it enough okay all right so do you want to run through the second one yeah okay begin scene the sound of static and muffled voices can be heard as the episode begins <sighs> mike what's going on with the microphones just a sec 
Let me check the connections. It's always something with these microphones. <laughs> Welcome to the Cortex Podcast, where technical difficulties are just another part of the show. <laughs> I guess you're right. All right, we're good to go. Let's get started. Today, we're going to talk about the latest advancements in neural networks and how they're changing the way we think about AI. And we'll also be discussing some of the ethical implications of these developments. It's going to be a great episode, so let's dive in. The sound of intro music begins to play as the episode officially starts. So there's also stage directions in this one, which just threw me in the like threw me in the middle of it. I didn't read them out loud, but it's like <laughs> more static and muffling. The sound of the microphones being adjusted can be heard. It's also telling us to laugh, which is also weird. Yeah, so it's giving us emotional instructions like CGP Gray colon brackets frustrated. Mike, what's going on with these microphones? Mike Hurley calmly just a sec. Let's check the connections. So this again is is like. I think we need to just pause here for a moment because even this is kind of mind blowing when you start playing around with it to realize like, oh, I can type into a machine, give me a script for a podcast. And it does spit out like this is as stage directions or, or, or more like closed captions, right? Here's the person. Here's the sound that's taking place in the background. Here's what they're saying, like alternating the dialogue between these two people. Even here, just a little bit, one of the bigger deals that you can see is it understands the previous state of things, which was always a limit with the older tools like GPT-3, which is why they were never very impressive, is it would just like respond to the previous sentence and tell you something and, and that was it. Whereas here you can just be like, just keep writing a conversation and it will keep track of the state of the conversation. Like the mm -hmm. conversation can progress and respond to itself in all sorts of ways that it couldn't before. So do you want to go through the third conversation here? Yeah, I think this is the best one. I gave it a little bit more. Okay. My prompt was, write a cold open for the Cortex podcast of CGP Grey and Mike Hurley. They are having microphone issues as always. At the end, they say levels, levels. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. Begin scene. Sound of microphone feedback. Oh, here we go again. Yep, it's just another day at the Cortex office. Can you hear me now? Not really, no. All right, let me adjust the levels here. Yeah, levels. Levels are key. <laughs> okay, I think we're good now. Finally. Welcome to Cortex. I'm CGP Gray, and with me as always is Mike Hurley. Yep, and we are having microphone issues, as always. <laughs> yep, but we're here to talk about all things productivity, creativity, and technology. Levels, levels. Levels, levels. Let's get started. That's the best one, I think. I still feel like it's a little generic, but it's interesting that yes. with the greater direction, you can push it. You can force it. More towards creating what it is that you want to create. Mm -hmm. I think this kind of thing would be much better if you used examples of vastly more well-known people that it would have databases of like i think that's why you you end up getting this like genericness is it just doesn't really know very much about us mm -hmm. but if you pick two like celebrities or well-known politicians people for whom there's a large corpus of them talking having played around with chat gpt you can get some absolutely frighteningly impressive examples of whatever it is you're looking for. It's particularly good at poetry. Yeah, they use that example a lot. Like, for example, I, I was trying to get some of these because the first one I did ages ago and the two most recent ones, I actually got those today because for the past few days, I've been trying to access ChatGPT and it's been down because of load issues or whatever. And on their kind of like waiting screen as such, they just generate poetry. Uh, yeah, I was I was just loading up it now, and it's it's yeah, I'm getting the same thing of like ChatGPT is at capacity right now, uh, probably because the whole world is trying to use it. Yeah. The thing that, of course, I wanted to see just straight away was when I first got a chance to try it hands on. Was I asked it basically sort of generic school homework essay type questions? Mm. So here's the thing that you can do, right? You can say, I need a book report about the themes in Lord of the Flies as they relate to modern politics in Germany, written as though I was a 10th grader in Germany. And it will do that, right? Like it'll boom, 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 like totally spit out 
a very good seven paragraph essay that will do that kind of thing. And the ability to even tweak it to be like, don't make it too good, right? I'm just in 12th grade or I'm in fourth grade. My dad had a really good one where he asked it something along the lines of, I'm a fourth grader and need to do a presentation on grasshoppers or something, like some kind of insect. And please write the script for me for what I need to say in front of the class as a fourth grader. Oh my God, this was unbelievably good for like, this is exactly what a fourth grader would would do and say if they were writing a report on some bug. I did the Lord of the Flies one as you were talking. Mm-hmm. It's good. Oh, did you get through? Yeah. Yeah, my first take on this was, oh, this is the death of homework. <laughs> um, yeah. Why do, you, why do you say yeah like that? Well, okay, so I... F- uh, for homework, maybe it will will fly because by and large, right, like I'm imagining, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm imagining most homework essays read similarly from kids. Like there isn't a lot of like variation mm-hmm. um, except for I expect in some outstanding students or whatever might be able to turn something in which is genuinely different in some way, right? Mm-hmm. But like what I feel like I've seen a lot with chat gpt is people saying like this is gonna change marketing because of this and then they you know they will give a prompt and they'll have some kind of response and the response is they just feel like somebody went to google and typed in the question and then copy and pasted the answers because that is i feel like ultimately at the moment a lot of what is going on here right it's like this information exists somewhere online this model that they are using has sucked in all this information and can interpret it. Mm -hmm. But what that means is, at least to me, it feels like a lot of the stuff is written like that. Like somebody went to Google and Wikipedia and did some research and wrote something about it. Mm -hmm. Like there doesn't feel like a lot of originality, at least in some of these things that I've seen, which tend to be along the lines of like, oh, watch out for your job. Like, and, Again, this is whatever version it is, right? But it's effectively to the public version one. It is already very impressive here, but I just don't know if I would be ready to say, like, this is the end of every type of thinking work because ChatGPT can just do it for us. Yeah, I want to be clear here. I'm not saying it's the end of every kind of thinking work, right? That's not what ChatGPT is. No way. But it's what a lot of people are saying, right? You know, like... I feel like a lot of the conversation is just like, well, this is it now. Well, yeah. So so even though I have definitely been the AI doom and gloom person, chat GPT in its current form, I don't think is that. Mm-hmm. There's a reason there's a reason that I picked homework in particular. Yeah. Because homework to me is just I mean, so much of it is just obvious bullshit work and it's it's like not really I mean, like, I'm just I'm trying to think about how to express some ideas. One of the things with a lot of questions that like you as a teacher, you actually you actually kind of want very low variance in the essays you get back from students because it makes them way easier to mark. Uh, So like if you're a student and you've ever had your school teach you something of like, oh, hey, if you're writing a, a little essay that needs to argue for a point. It needs to follow this five paragraph structure as like you introduce the idea with and here is your thesis. And then you have like three paragraphs about it. And then you summarize why that was great in the end or whatever. Like different schools have different versions of this. You're not being given that because it's a great way to write a convincing essay. You're given that because it's real easy to mark. That's why you are given that is like, oh, if I have to spend less of my marks and thinking time on the actual essay and can instead be evaluating structure of things, that dramatically reduces the workload in marking an essay. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like that might not be obvious, but like schools don't teach you how to write convincingly. They're optimizing for a teacher has to mark a 100 or 200 or 300 of these things. And so having them all be in a format. As a student for written homework questions and like book reports and all kinds of things, there's a weird way in which you're kind of punished for thinking very creatively or doing something different. You need to have something that just like fits in the pipeline and 
in many ways, you're kind of optimizing for not catching the teacher's attention. And that's why I think like chat GPT is, is like, oh my God, it's the most perfect yeah. tool for this. Yeah. That's what's going on here. The fourth grade of grasshopper thing, by the way, is awesome. Oh, did, okay. Can you, you want to read this little sample? I still can't get through. Hi, everyone. Today, I'm going to talk to you about grasshoppers. Grasshoppers are really cool bugs that you might see in your backyard or at the park. They're green and have big legs, so they can jump really far. Grasshoppers eat plants and leaves, and they have big jaws that help them chew up their food. They also have big eyes so they can see where they're going when they jump. This is my favorite part, though. Grasshoppers lay their eggs in the ground, and when they hatch, they look like little mini grasshoppers. They grow (laughs) bigger and bigger until they become adults. That's it for my presentation about grasshoppers. I hope you learned something new and cool about these bugs. Thanks for listening. That's great. That really is like a fourth grader. It's great, right? Like including the hi everyone, like yeah. Yeah, it's great. Do they look like mini grasshoppers or do they look like larvae? I don't actually know. But that seems like something a kid would say, right? Totally. Yeah, yeah. It's that's a perfect kid sentence. Yeah. And like you totally you totally can get really creative things out of this. Okay, so one of the one here's one of the issues that I've had with what's happened with Chat GPT when it came out is if anyone's listening to this show now and they're like, Oh, I haven't heard of this thing before, let me go try it. The version that you're going to try is almost certainly less interesting than the version right now that Mike and I are talking about. And it's definitely less interesting than the one that went out on launch day because I have a feeling that the people behind ChatGPT were quite surprised by like the entirety of the internet trying to get this thing to do everything on one day. And it became very clear that they were like live coding in more and more restrictions on what it would do or what it wouldn't do or what it would say or what it would not say. Uh, And so it was very fun to be on the internet on launch day where you could like, where people were doing all sorts of things to like trick it or try to get around its restrictions. And it was super interesting that first day. And I've been using it since and it's clearly become less interesting and much more formulaic with a lot of stuff. I mean, it was also a little bit more depressing too, right? Because there were so many biases because based on what the internet was pulling in. Yeah, but like what these systems are is they're they're like... St- Here's 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 my problem. Like, so when people describe how these things work, you talk about, oh, it's it's kind of producing like a statistically likely output based on the input of text. Mm-hmm. And I, I think that both kind of over and undersells the thing. Mm-hmm. You know, like, there's a way in which people use that to dismiss it, where they go, well, there's no thinking that's happening. It's just you fed it a bunch of text, and it's just giving you back what's in the text. It's like, yes, that's that's true. But I also kind of think that's what a lot of people are doing. Like, I really think a lot of people are very chat GPT like mm-hmm. where it's like when you talk to someone, I don't know, sometimes you could feel more and more like, oh, I'm just talking with a thing that's giving me like the most probable answers in this conversation. I mean, or sometimes like I'm talking with the Facebook algorithm, like I can feel that in talking to you. I can yes. see where you get your news and I can see where what is affecting you. And I, you know, like. I feel like I am talking to a news algorithm in a person. Yeah, it's it's funny that you bring that up because... So if, if anyone listening to the show ever does the thing that I have often suggested, which is like pulling back from news in very many ways or like try, or like I've done, you take major breaks from the internet, there totally is what you've just said, Mike. This weird thing that becomes much more obvious is like, how ideas are spread and how ideas get into people and and you can like you're aware of it before but when you're really distant from things it it becomes very clear like oh i'm not talking to a person i'm talking to this news channel and like that's everything that's in that person's head or like you said oh this is like I know what corner of the internet this person exists in and I'm talking to that corner of the internet. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, the, like I think that's actually a really good way to describe the way chat GPT works in person form. And yeah, we can know that experience. So so this is why I think it's funny when people use this to like 
undersell what chat gpt is doing and they're like ah, it can't be very interesting it's just going to reflect whatever it's been fed yeah but also i think that's how brains work like they yeah. reflect what they have been fed so like this is not the the slam dunk argument against this system being able to do things well i do have a counterpart on that which is if we like you know for for the type of person that believes that this is like the future of everything right of which there are definitely a subset of people if chat gpt just works by what it is ingested if we assume that all great thought will come from these ai robots in the future where are they going to get the new from like if they end up just like cycling through all of the stuff that other ai has generated like that's the thing that I don't know if I know the answer to that, right? Like, if these things work by ingesting a bunch of stuff, where does the new come in? I, I mean, look, we can't possibly do this because it would just take too long. I think to have a complete conversation about what is occurring with AI mm -hmm. and where can it go is a question that really has to dive quite deeply down into what do you think thinking is? And that... Uh, like many things, ultimately dives down to the very bottom of the universe, atoms and electromagnetic fields interacting with each other. And like I've had that conversation with people, but that's just like, it's too much to talk about in a sure. podcast. Like it just takes forever. Like my summary on it is my, like my perspective is that what we are doing in metal and software is not fundamentally different than what is being done with meat and neurons firing. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, like these things will eventually get better and better. And so the question of like, does something new come out of that? I really think it's a metaphor just like a, like a human brain. Human brains are just like ingesting the world that's around them, mm -hmm. but they do still produce things that we think are new in some way. But like, as of right now, human brains are just way bigger than these right. or, or i should rephrase it it's not that they're bigger uh, i think the neuron numbers might actually be comparable but they're significantly more interconnected than these systems are i don't think it's impossible mm -hmm. but i don't think what i'm seeing right now tells me that it's possible if that makes sense yeah what i'm seeing right now is interesting it does not tell me i do not feel like i can draw a very clear line to original thought this episode is brought to you by our good friends at Memberful, the easiest way to sell memberships to your audience used by the biggest creators on the web to generate sustainable, recurring income while diversifying a revenue stream. You may have heard us talk about Mortex, which is part of the Relay FM membership program. Memberful is the platform that we use to power all of that. It makes it super easy for us to generate an extra revenue stream and deliver bonus content to our members. I really love Memberful. It has completely changed the way I think about content creation and our business here at Relay FM by giving us all of the tools that we need to create this content and make it available for our members. It gives us another form of income other than advertising, so we're able to kind of diversify our business that way. But I'm also super happy about how easy they make it for us to integrate with our Discord, for example, to make that really awesome for our members, and so much more that makes it really great for us to provide more tax and the Relay FM membership program Program to people that want it and give them tons of benefits. Memberful makes this so incredibly easy with everything you need to run a membership program of your own. They let you do custom branding so it feels like it's yours to your members that are coming in. They have gift subscriptions, Apple Pay support, free trials, private podcast feed, and tons more while leaving you with full control and ownership of everything that relates to your audience, brand, and membership. They have really great analytics. They just introduced a cancellation survey thing, so if people want to cancel, you can find out why. It's really awesome. They also have paid email newsletters that you can send directly through Memberful without needing to connect to a third-party email provider. You can even publish your paid newsletter content to a Memberful-hosted members-only website, and there's no additional fee when you You've signed up for Memberful's pro or premium plans. If you're a content creator, Memberful can help you monetize your passion. Get started today at memberful.com slash Cortex with no credit card required. That is memberful.com slash Cortex. Go there now and check it out. This could be the start of something exciting. Our thanks to Memberful for their support of this show and Relay FM. So, okay, this might be a little long for the podcast, but I want to give you what was my best response with chat gpt okay and this was on day one okay here is the prompt i said write a fictional story about coffee beans so here was the story 
Once upon a time, in a land far, far away, there lived a group of magical coffee beans. These beans were not like the ordinary coffee beans that you might find in your local grocery store. No, these beans were special, each with its own unique personality and characteristics. There was the bold and brash Robusta Bean, who always wanted to be the center of attention. He loved to boast about his high caffeine content and his strong, full-bodied flavor. But his boastfulness often got him into trouble, and he often found himself being ground up and brewed into strong, bitter cups of coffee that no one wanted to drink. Next, there was the delicate and refined Arabia Bean. She was the most popular of all the coffee beans, with a delicate floral aroma and a smooth, sweet flavor. She was often sought after by the finest coffee shops and restaurants, and she was always in demand. But she was also very sensitive, and she didn't like being roasted too dark or brewed too strong, lest she lose her delicate flavor. Then there was the exotic and mysterious mocha bean, who hailed from the distant land of Yemen. He was a rare and valuable bean with a deep, rich flavor and a hint of chocolatey sweetness. But he was also very fickle and could only be grown in certain conditions, making him difficult to cultivate and harvest. Finally, there was the jolly and cheerful espresso bean, who always wanted to be in a good mood. He was a small but mighty bean with an intense, concentrated flavor that could give anyone a kick of energy. But he could also be a bit of a hothead, and if he was brewed too long, he could become bitter and burnt-tasting. All of the coffee beans lived together in harmony, each with their own unique flavor and personality. But one day, disaster struck when a group of evil scientists decided to create a frankenbean, a monstrous hybrid of all the different coffee beans. The frankenbean was huge and powerful, with the caffeine content of a robusta, the smoothness of the arabia, the richness of a mocha, and the intensity of an espresso. But the frankenbean quickly turned on its creators, rampaging through the land and destroying everything in its path. The other coffee beans were terrified, and they didn't know what to do. But just when all hope seemed lost, the bold and brash Robusta Bean stepped forward, bravely facing down the frankenbean and using his high caffeine content to defeat it once and for all. And so the coffee beans lived happily ever after, each enjoying their own unique flavor and personality, and never forgetting the brave Robusta Bean who saved them all. The end. Didn't stick the landing, but everything else was great. That's pretty good. Oh, it was great. It was very entertaining. I thought it was very funny, too. It was was a good story. I think that's a great example of pulling from things that exist, but also creating something new. That was much better than I was expecting for the prompt, write a fictional story about coffee beans. Yep. Now, I am very convinced that they have wildly turned down the ability of the thing since then, because I have not been getting similar kinds of responses when I use ChatGPT now. But this was like the day one, you know, hour six, while I imagine all the engineers were panicking of like, everyone's trying to break our AI system out of the box. Like, what are we going to do? So yeah, anyway, I I feel like (sighs) that could basically be a children's illustrated story as it exists. Like you said, it doesn't quite stick the landing, but I feel like it's there. I Mm -hmm. could totally see that as like a kid's illustrated storybook, 100%. That's the best result that I got out of ChatGPT when I was playing around with it on day one. And I think these things are only getting better, so I fully expect it's going to increase. One of the things that was very interesting was watching my father play around with it. And he got into a little loop of, of asking it for movie scripts around various topics. Mm-hmm. Write a script where Indiana Jones prevents a diamond heist, you know, and that it would just like boom, 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 put out whatever. <laughs> and he was genuinely enthralled by reading them uh, again on like the very first day. And so much so I could see like he just kept typing in like different movie scripts. And he's like, wow, it'll just like write the movie that I wanted to write. This is unbelievable. I think it is already there for some level of new creativity. It might not be amazingly new creativity, but I, I think it's doing something that's more than just more than just like a kind of Google copy and paste. Uh, that's what I think it's already doing. I can't express my feelings as such, but I feel differently to this than the image generation, and I don't really know why. What do you mean? Do you feel like the image generation is more creative? No, it's about like 
you know, like I've, uh, you know, I have spoken many times and still try to get my feelings out on this and it's complicated about like what it is to be human and, and human creativity and stuff like that. Where I feel like these models, it's, it's really hard. It's like these models, what they're doing is, it's less impressive to me. Mm-hmm. It feels more what anyone could do in a sense of like, not like that story is, is a standout, right? Mm-hmm. But like a lot of the things that I've seen myself and other examples that I've seen around, again, they feel very much like spend an hour on Google and you could probably come out with something like this yourself, right? Like there is that kind of feeling to it. But like something like Dolly, some same companies, by the way, in case you don't know, it's all from OpenAI. These two, mm-hmm. Dolly and ChatGPT come from one company called OpenAI. What Dolly is doing is something that the average person could not do. Mm. But what ChatGPT is doing, I think the average person could do with the same input, right? Like you could look at a thousand images and could not paint a painting to the skill of Dali. But you could read a thousand articles and could probably turn something out in that's close to what ChatGPT can do. Yeah. I don't know how that makes me feel, but that's just how I feel in looking at them. But I can't really express why I, I don't have this existential dread feeling about ChatGPT like I do about Dali. But I don't know why that is the case. Mm-hmm. Well, I suggest like a thing to think about that people underrate in economic change. So, so like I think ChatGPT is currently in the phase of people are doing the thing where they overestimate the change in the short term but they underestimate the change in the long term which is like just a general phenomenon that always happens everybody does that like i do that when you see like a new tech demo i think one of the questions to often ask about like how impactful will this be is the question of if it makes something significantly faster or cheaper not necessarily like does it do a new thing And if it does an existing thing much faster and cheaper, you can like rate higher in your mind the chance that this is going to have a big impact. And so when you keep saying like, oh, this is what a person could do by reading a bunch of articles on Google and writing something up, I don't disagree with you that for tons of stuff that is totally true. But the the game changer here is that it's so much faster. Yeah, but it ain't cheaper. Well, it's not cheaper for OpenAI to be running, but it's cheaper for people to use. Yeah. And I still think it's cheaper at scale. Like even if you, I mean, just based on some of the AI art stuff, like signing up for those paid services, it's still like much cheaper at scale, even if the cost of running the servers for the individual company is quite large. But so, so this is just where like when I think of the death of homework, the big deal of this is that you know, ChatGPT can do 80% of your work in seconds, and then you can spend an hour tidying up all of your homework assignments, right? Instead of uh, spending, you know, many hours working on all of them. Mm-hmm. Or I had the interesting phenomenon of coming across, I was on Hacker News, just like reading a bunch of the articles that were linked. It's a discussion site like Reddit. And there was an article that was kind of weird. And I went back into the chat and it's like, oh, this was an article that was written by ChatGPT. It's like the first time that it happened where I came across like some website, you know, that like contracts out articles had one that was written by ChatGPT. And what I thought was very funny and very weird was that the author showed up in in the comments and was like, oh, hey, yeah, I'm the guy who wrote this article. Yes, I used ChatGPT, but all of the ideas were mine. I just prompted chat gpt to get the words right it was very strange i thought like oh it's the first time i've come across this like here's an article that's written by chat gpt and uh i'm gonna disagree with the person that they wrote that article i think the very concept of like the ideas in the article are mine but i didn't write it is hilarious but nonetheless that person could have a huge output of articles uh, in a, like a much faster time scale with the with the assistance of something like ChatGPT, uh, even if they're going through and like editing it afterwards. I think so, it's a CNET, right? I saw some headlines about this. So so that's like one area that's 
quite interesting. And one of the other things that I'm, I'm going to be curious to see what happens with this is when I had been talking to some people behind the scenes who were working on systems like this, like language model systems, one of the things I was really surprised to hear is the number of people who said that they were using this as their search engine that they had given up using mm-hmm. Google and instead were using their own language models as a kind of Google. And that's why I think one of the the, like the constraints that, that OpenAI has put on ChatGPT is they're like, it can't know anything about the way that the world currently exists. It doesn't know anything about what's happened since like 2020 or whatever. Like they've really limited any concept for it of uh, like what the world currently is. Of course, that is the public facing side, you know, back when it was first launched, people could totally trick it of like, oh, no, you know, for open AI, it 100% knows about the current world. They're just not letting people play with that. Mm -hmm. But yeah, like this kind of stuff could be super useful in search engines. And like, I was very surprised when I was talking to people to hear that that they were using it as a search engine. But having played around with it a bit, it won't replace my Google, I think, for right now. But there's definitely been a couple of times where I've had questions that I would put in the variety of, I'm not exactly sure what I'm asking, but can you direct me in the right down the right path here? Or like, I just don't have any of the words for this thing, but if I can just describe the situation, can you tell me like what the words are that I should be Googling for? And ChatGPT is already really good at that. And I just saw the headline, but apparently Microsoft is looking to do some kind of $10 billion investment, perhaps, in mm-hmm. uh, ChatGPT to incorporate it into Bing so that they can have that as a search engine thing. And like, that's another area where I think, man, on the short term, if that happens, it could be quite useful as a tool for kind of helping people use search engines the way they want to use search engines. Like I think people want to use search engines like it's a very knowledgeable reference librarian. Like, hey, I'm looking for a thing about this. Can you help me out with that? And ChatGPT can totally do that right now. So we'll see where this stuff goes. The Microsoft thing is really interesting like because OpenAI is using Azure, I think. Hmm. And this deal apparently that's going around as we're recording this it ends up with like Microsoft would end up eventually owning a large cho- chunk of OpenAI if they go through with it. Like, hmm. It's it's really intriguing. I mean, it's clearly Microsoft are like we would like Bing to be better. Mm. There is also apparently rumblings around Silicon Valley that that Google believes that it has better tools, but it's too scared to put them out. Like of both image generation and text generation, which I one hundred percent believe that they would like if anyone's going to be able to do this google should be the company in theory right with like the the immense data sets that they have and the human trained effectively ai that they've generated over time right where like yeah. you search for the thing and click on the thing that you want that is positive tra- training right for for google but apparently google is concerned about the public perception of the quality of their tools for like this similar thing of what you're talking about what open ai did is like we need to put some barriers around this thing yeah that's google's concern yeah i, I mean i i would say even i found that first day with open ai i was a bit like this feels reckless <laughs> this 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 feels like a bad decision or like i don't know i was i was just really kind of wondering what's going on over there like what what was the what was the conversation but there was some real wacky stuff when people were really trying to break around the system where you could see little parts of it i think the most alarming one that i came across was people found that you could prompt it to be able to express the idea of working with amazon web services so i was like oh ChatGPT knows the correct code for interfacing with Amazon Web Services. I was like, oh, I don't like that at all. <laughs> that seems like, oh, please not. Like, let's not let's not have an AI system that that knows how to do that. That's that's a real bad idea, guys. I mean, look, I'm just if I had to place money on it, I would for sure place money on Google has the best system, but that doesn't necessarily mean they have the most public facing system. It would be quite a surprise if someone else was able to be doing better than Google was. Like you said, given the just absurd amount of computing power and data that they have at their hands, it it would, 
I feel like Google would have had to drop the ball quite badly to not internally have something that's doing really well on this front. But yeah, uh, I think a lot has happened since October. Yeah. I, th- I think I this don't may even be... really know how I feel about this stuff anymore. <laughs> like, it's, I think I've been like ground down now over time. <laughs> I'm sorry, Mike. I have ground you down with the AI it's stuff. Not I do you. apologize for that. It's not you. It's it's the internet. Because like, I didn't need to have these conversations with you to know this stuff was happening. You know what I mean? Yeah. We started talking about it because it was just bubbling up and becoming impossible not to notice. And it just it was just the timing of everything exploded. And I think that the most explosive thing that could possibly have happened between the last time we spoke and now did happen, which was a massive public demonstration of look at what language models can do just like the ai art stuff this this is only going one way which is better and better one day mike we'll have to have the conversation that goes all the way down to the atoms of ai this episode of cortex is brought to you by squarespace the only one platform for building your brand and growing your business online you can stand out with a beautiful website engage with your audience and sell your products services or the content that you create because squarespace has you covered They make it super easy to get started. This is my favorite thing about Squarespace, bar none. They have these beautiful templates. You just sign up, you go and take a look at their wonderful template options. They have like this beautiful library for you to pick from. It is as easy as browsing for the category of site that you want to make or the type of business that you have to find the perfect starting place. And then it is amazingly, infinitely customizable. You can change the layout, the colors, the fonts, the sizes of everything, and it's just as easy as dragging and dropping or using some sliders. They make it so much fun to design and create a website of your own. It is not difficult at all all. You can then have a blog right there. They have powerful blogging tools that they've been building for 10 years or more to share your stories, photos, videos, updates. Everything can be categorized, shared, scheduled to make your content work for you. And then you can use their wonderful SEO tools. You have a suite of integrated features at your fingertips and useful guides to maximize your prominence among search results and then use insights to grow your website or your business. If you ever wonder where your site visitors and sales are coming from, which channels are most effective for you, all of this is in Squarespace. Then you have that data. You can then use this to improve your website and build a marketing strategy based on your top keywords or popular products and content. I spent a little bit of time recently revamping my personal website, mikehurley.net, which is on Squarespace, because I wanted to make sure that I had a really good landing page where people could come to. They could see all the things that I'm working on, or the podcast, the projects, that kind of stuff. Super easy to do. I just say, oh, I want to do this. And then within an hour or so, I'd redesign my entire website. I love it. Squarespace is the best. Go to squarespace.com slash cortex for a free trial with no credit card required. Then when you're ready to launch your website to the world, use the offer code cortex and you will save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. That is squarespace.com slash Cortex. And then when you sign up, use the offer code Cortex and you will get 10% of your first purchase and show your support for the show. A thanks to Squarespace for the continued support of Cortex and Relay FM. So another pretty big thing since we last spoke is that I have left Twitter. Left, left? What does, what does left mean, Mike? My account exists. Okay. I don't look at it. I don't. Look at the timeline. I don't look at my replies. Logged out of everywhere. Apps deleted on everything. Does your... Do you still post stuff? Nope. Is there like... Okay. The only posting that I do manually is to the Cortex account. Okay. I can't load Twitter on this computer. Did you have a dramatic I left Twitter tweet is your final tweet or kind of okay but not i don't think it was dramatic let me read it to you because i was actually pretty proud of it i just what did i say it's time for me to put my attention elsewhere like find my shows find my products streaming instagram links i said or wherever you get your podcasts or wherever you get your podcast i like that that is good right because that's the the joke right like find us wherever you get your podcasts so i just thought that that would be my, and then that's it. That was my last tweet. I like that. That's a very good last tweet. I think you, you're right to be proud of that. Yeah. I didn't want to make it like a whole big thing, like a whole big political thing, but I wanted to be mm-hmm. able to pin a tweet which right. had all of my places, right? Mm-hmm. So that was what I did. And yeah, it's been a month. Okay. So this is very interesting to me. What are your reasons for, for leaving? Like what was the... 
I don't I don't know if this is correct to say, but I feel like you've you've had a on again off again relationship with Twitter over mm-hmm. the years. Mm-hmm. Pinning that tweet feels more definitive than things in the past. So I'm just I'm just kind of curious, like what what motivated this? Like what was your reasoning for doing this? Well, realistically, my on again off again has only been in my feelings. Like I've never changed my approach yeah. to it as such. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah so that that is what I meant. Just yeah. Like. When I talk to you about yeah. things, how like what is the what's the barometer of Twitter in Mike's brain right now is has not been a consistent reading o- over the years. No, I, f- I feel like that there has been a downward trend. Mm-hmm. My reasons are threefold for why now. Mm-hmm. So one, since Elon Musk took over, the service is taking a nosedive in things that frustrate me. I think a lot of the product decisions are weird. I don't like some of the advertising changes. I don't like this sense of like uh, extortion that I feel like is taking over on Twitter. It's like you've been verified for a long time for whatever reason and now we want to start charging you for it. It's like little things like that have been grating on me. Like that's part one. That wouldn't have been enough if it wasn't for the other things I feel like. So, well, also, I don't like some of the policy decisions that have been made for people that are being brought back onto the service, but I don't really need to get into that more than that point. I am frustrated. Actually, point one, two is like, (laughs) it's just annoying to be on Twitter and like was annoying to me being on Twitter and all anyone wanted to talk about was Elon Musk. Like, I just found that frustrating. Like, Mm -hmm. it just wasn't fun. It was just really annoying. And all anyone wanted to talk about was Twitter and Elon Musk. And it's just like... I don't, I'm not really interested in that. Like, and it was just frustrating to me. Twitter is at its worst when it turns its eye upon itself yeah. and then just wants to talk about Twitter. And this is the longest I've ever seen that happen. It's, it's yeah. just been constant and it's just annoying. And like, I don't need that in my life, right? Yeah. That's point it's, one. It's really, it strikes me as really tiresomely self-involved. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> point two. So many of my friends, people I whose work I enjoy as well, have left Twitter. Hmm. So if I sign in, my timeline it wouldn't be as fun anyway. So like what was happening is I was feeling these things of point one of like this isn't fun to be on anymore. I don't agree with the decisions they're making. I don't agree with the moderation changes they're making. Like that stuff was grating on me. But I was like, but this is a community, right? Like I'm part of this community. I'm separating the platform from the people and it's the people that I want to read. Well, then they all started leaving. <laughs> so it's like, all right, we're not, I haven't got a lot to hold on uh-huh. to here. But then point three is the biggest one for me. I have mm-hmm. wanted to do this for years for my own mental health. Mm-hmm. And I've finally done it. Like point one and two gave me the cover to do the thing that I've wanted to do, which is leave Twitter. <laughs> hilariously for me this is the first theme in years where i did not try and shoehorn this in as a part of it and it's the one Mm. that i actually did it on you know i've had these things of like changing my approach to the internet and all that kind of stuff and a lot of it was for getting away from twitter and there's a couple of reasons for this one twitter's timeline is like typically a not fun place to be because it's like full of people being angry about things all the time Mm. and whether that anger is warranted or not is not the point it's like how much of my day do i want to spend ingesting the anger of people right that had an overall negative effect on me where it was like surprise you know like i'm going on twitter for whatever reason and surprise atrocity you know like that that wasn't necessarily what i was going for at that moment similarly the way that people react, like the way that people can be to people online. So like I would sometimes be on Twitter and then someone would just start being randomly nasty to me for like seemingly no reason. And Mm -hmm. I don't, and it's like a similar thing of like that didn't play well for me of like the surprise of it, you know? And that surprise over time morphed into dread Hmm. so like i would open the twitter app and be like all right here we go even if there was nothing happening so like these behaviors ended up creating this cycle of of expecting it and being surprised by it and like 
that just wasn't good for me. So hmm. time to leave it behind. This is why, like reason three is why, unlike many people, I am not replacing my Twitter usage with Mastodon or any other service like that. So this kind of social media for me, this like text-based short posting social media where people, anyone in the world can get in touch with me or I can get in touch with anyone in the world, like send them messages or read what anyone's got to say, that's gone. Like I want to see what my life is like without this endless stream of thoughts and opinions and news all the time from everywhere. Hmm. So that's where I am. When you say that the first two points about like the the current changes with Twitter, how they're like how they're acting as cover for the actual thing, mm -hmm. point three about your mental health, like like what do you mean by what do you mean by that? What do you mean by cover? I right, said so there's two things going on. One is I needed something to push me, like I needed an excuse to do it, right? Because nothing was changing. It had to be me that all of a sudden made that change all on my own, right? Hmm. Which was not easy for me to do. And the other was, well, I always felt like my community expected me to be there, like listeners expected me to be there. So I didn't want to be like, oh, it's time for me to leave everyone, you know, like, you know, mm. out of the blue. I felt like, and we're going to get, I want to talk about this a little bit more in general, but it, I would have felt like I was like better than everyone else. It was like this feeling of like, no, I'm leaving Twitter now, like, uh, this service, it, I, it would have felt weird to me. I can't explain it fully. There's like this relevance thing that's bubbling around in my brain anyway that I want to talk about. But like, I feel like if I would have just left Twitter, it would have kind of been a sign that I didn't want to hear from people at all. Do you mean that in the sense that you think that's how people would have interpreted it? Yes, Okay. Yeah, I was worried that people would have thought of me that way. Right, not that it's actually the case. Yes. That's how you're worried mm -hmm. people wouldn't. Oh, uh, okay, all right. I was like, who who on earth ever thinks that someone's like, oh, I'm better than you by leaving Twitter? But it, your, that's your concern, yeah. is that that's how the audience might react to something like that. That, like, because I had always been and was always very, like, proud of, especially early in my career, about being approachable. And, like, it is something that's important to me. And I always loved that that was something that I could do, that, like, people could ask me questions and I could answer them and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But the problem was, in doing that, as the world changed, the type of things that would be sent to me changed and the tone was different and things could get weird. And it just ended up being not as nice as it used to be. Mm -hmm. It was kind of like whether people would feel that way or wouldn't feel that way, it wasn't the thing. It was like a thing in my brain. I didn't want to come off as being this like unapproachable person or like I didn't want to come off as being like, oh, like you can't, no, you can't get in touch with me on Twitter. So I'm just going to leave. But in so many people leaving, it's given me the opportunity to try this because I feel like enough people understand the halfway point now, which is... I've left Twitter like so many people have, right? Hmm. But what I'm not doing is replacing it with something else because I want to try and live my life without this thing. Yeah, it doesn't matter now, but I, I this is one of those cases where I just wonder how much that worry of the audience interpretation of your actions is a would have been a real thing or not. But I get I get what you mean that if this is a move that you have been eyeing up, now is an excellent time to make that yep. move because you're not going to get pushback. Because I feel like people can understand at least part of it, right? Even if they don't get all of it. There would have been two parts before of like, why do you want to leave Twitter? And why don't you want to be on this social media? Well, now it's just, why don't you want to be on this social media? Which is half of the thing, right? It's like, it feels mm. like there is... It's easy to understand why I don't want to be on Twitter. Like, a lot of people in our community understand that now. Not everyone, and that's fine. And, like, I'm not judging other people, right? Like, this is not hmm. a yardstick for everyone. Even my fellow creators, right? Like, if you, if this is a, a thing that's good for you, and, like, mentally, go for it. For me, it isn't. Like, it's mm -hmm. just not. It, it is bad on my mental health to... And it's not even like that. I was like being barraged by haters constantly, right? No, no, no. no. But like, I'm on, I'm totally on board with this, right? To me, that this lines up with a lot of my 
feelings always about like the news right which even now like the very concept of what is bounded within those two words has wildly changed since we started talking on this podcast years ago mm-hmm. because like twitter is functionally a news feed in a way that it like sort of wasn't at the dawn but it, it's the same thing of there's a variance in the interruption of your day and why would you want that? Or like you need a really good positive upside if there's a thing that can just derail your day randomly at any moment. That's it. Yeah. And like this is something that I am aware of with people who really follow the news where you can see that like something in the news has totally derailed them in a way that just doesn't make sense to the scale of its impact on their life and it's just you know as an outside observer it's a bit like you know you don't have you don't have to do that (laughs) um you you don't have to roll the dice randomly for you're going to get derailed for a thing that either doesn't affect you or that you are unable to affect in many ways Mm -hmm. so like when, when you just said there of um you started to get the feeling of, of opening Twitter and you're like, all right, you know, what's it going to be today? Am I going to find out some horrible piece of news or like, I'm just going to get swept up in whatever the internet is angry about right now. And, you know, like with 24 hour news where it's a bit like, Oh, how mysterious there's always news 24 hours a day. It's like on Twitter, there's some standard amount of anger And it's like, sometimes that anger is focused on very just things. But it's like, there needs to be a a certain level of anger always. And if there's nothing just to get angry about, it'll be something ridiculous that people will just like, everyone's angry about this right now. And so you like, you can easily get swept up in whatever the current angry thing is. And then also like being a person on the internet you do have the issue of just running into someone is really angry at you about something. And again, like maybe they have a good reason, maybe they don't, but you're just rolling the dice every time you open up Twitter. Mm-hmm. So like I'm, I'm totally on board with all of those as like very excellent reasons to want to leave the service. Like you're not, you're not going to get any pushback from me. about. It's this. not like, you that I'm worried about, right? <laughs> oh, you weren't, it wasn't me that you were concerned was going to berate you on the podcast. I like, felt Mike. like if there's one person in the world that knows it's you, cause you, you <laughs> did it right. You did it in the most extreme way. Mm-hmm. There is a feeling that I have, which it's, Exp- is expanding in different directions and I'm working on is being out of touch. I was literally about to make the joke like, but Mike, aren't you worried about being out of touch? Yes. Because that, like, that's what everybody says and I always find that kind of hilarious. Right, so. that, that is what I'm worried about and it comes in a <laughs> okay. few directions. It comes in one, people hear me say these things and they're like, oh, you're better than everyone else, huh? I, I still feel like that's a weird thing in your head. I just can't no, imagine any reasonable person having that kind of response, but I don't oh, know. Oh, but it's not... But yeah, I agree with you. Mm-hmm. Right, but this is the thing. is like the people that are, were making things difficult for me were the unreasonable people anyway, right? Yeah, yeah, by definition, yeah. Right? Reasonable people weren't the people that made it difficult for me to go on to, to Twitter sometimes, right? Because, mm-hmm. you know, a handful of times a month, I'd be dealing with an unreasonable person, and that w- would destroy a day for me. Yeah. You know? Like, someone would decide that they wanted to make fun of the way I pronounce words in, in a mm-hmm. day, and, like, that will stick in my mind for weeks, right? Mm-hmm. And, like, I don't want that. When I don't need to have that, and I, and I don't need Twitter, so it's like an easy thing for me to just get rid of, right? Like, this is where I ended up going. But the concern that I have is, like, people are like, oh, you're, you, what, you're so, <laughs> you're better than us, right? But that's one part, whatever, okay. I'll deal with that. Like, I don't need to appease to unreasonable people. Mm-hmm. The thing that I'm more worried about is that either I will lose track of the things that people were talking about or people will think I have. So hmm. I will use, say, for example, I'll use my Apple Focus shows, right, for this. Yeah, yeah. Because they're more news-focused. What's going on? What's the conversation of the day? 
what are people focusing on, right? That is mm-hmm. more of a concern for me, that either A, I'm not in tune with what the Apple community is thinking and talking about, or people think that I'm not because I have a differing opinion and I'm not on Mastodon. When if I was on Mastodon, they may just think I have a differing opinion, but I'm still informed. Hmm. Now, the perception part, I kind of can't do anything about that, right? There's like, people are going to think that about me or not. The actually staying in touch part, I am working on that. So I've increased the amount of websites and blogs are in my RSS. So like I'm able to bring in more opinions. And I've also Mm -hmm. got like a few people who I think are like tastemakers or some of the louder voices in the community. I have put their Mastodon feeds into my RSS reader. Mm -hmm. So if I ever want, and they're in a folder called Vibe Check. So if I ever want to see what the vibe is, I feel like I can go to this folder and can have a quick scan through it. But I don't read that like I would read Twitter. It's like a way to inform, like there's a big, there's like a bunch of news coming out. Let me go and check the vibe check folder and reader and see like what are people kind of saying about this. So this is kind of a thing that I'm trying to do to balance it right now. I know I have, I have a lot of thoughts, but it's like it's it's hard to articulate. I like so you're in an interesting position where you have many shows in which you are talking much more about topical things or like what is currently happening. And I just, I feel like the problem of the problem of staying informed is I feel like it's barely a problem. The whole thing with the modern world is like selection. It's, it's not about finding a thing. So, you know, I think it's always been the case that a person with some well-selected RSS feeds can be very adequately up to date on anything they care to because some RSS feeds are already a million times better than technologies were for trying to like keep in touch with what's going on. So I just like, I just don't perceive the problem of like, oh, I need to stay in touch as an actual problem. I I think what people are worried about is a kind of confusion with volume of consumption as proportional to amount of staying in touch. Mm -hmm. And I just don't think that that's the case. I think that's a, like a perception problem. You're not more in touch if you've heard about a thing seven times. You're just as in touch as if you heard about it once, like through one cleverly selected RSS feed. So I just, I can't conceive that you will actually lose touch in any way. And it's really funny because you having a folder called Vibe Check, it, it, to me, it's, it's like, oh, that feels like Mike is still too in touch. <laughs> like, that's kind of my initial response to that. It's like, oh, I would prefer a Mike who was more out of touch and didn't feel the need to have like a Vibe Check folder. But I can totally understand that as a transition away from Twitter of like, oh, maybe what's a Twitter or... I was going to say a Twitter-like thing, but it's actually different. It's more like what is a way to extract what you think is the value in Twitter without having that as a tool. I'm kind of using it like they're like microblogs, really, because I don't ever read what people are saying in response to these tweets. I don't see in this the responses people send. These are purely the tweet or they call them toots, which I just think is ridiculous. Toots oh to my. their... I know. Toots to their audiences. Oh, that's f- awful. I, there's a lot about Mastodon that just doesn't vibe with me as well, like, that, which is part of why it was so easy for me not to move. But it's, I think it... I don't care that's how many really videos awful. there are. I find it confusing, like, the overall structure of it. Uh, I find the URLs complicated. Like, there's a lot of it that I don't like. There's also something which is really funny to me that a lot of people left Twitter because they don't like this one guy who's controlling it. But Mastodon, inherently, like the way it is built as Mastodon, it is one person's decision about the mm-hmm. way that the service works. It's just all very funny to me, but I'm just not interested in it. Also, I, like, I just, I know literally nothing about Mastodon, but just the very fact that they want to call them toots is like, oh my God. 
you guys are setting up roadblocks for yourself you don't need to for mass adoption of this thing like mm-hmm. don't don't pick unappealing words mm-hmm. it, just because you think they're funny tweet was bad enough yeah tweet at least tweet had the advantage of being cute yeah and conceptually aligned with it's a bird and what do birds do they tweet it's mastodon's toot okay uh, I think the idea is it's it's meant to be like the sound they would make from their trunks, right? But like, yeah, that's not what people not are going to think. That's not how people think about it. And I actually don't think I, th- I believe it was originally pitched as a joke, mm-hmm. but then was adopted as the official nomenclature for the service. Wow, that's really regrettable, Mastodon. Uh, yeah, bad I decision. I mean, honestly, Gray, I think a lot of the decisions about Mastodon are regrettable, personally. But, <laughs> but I'm I'm happy mm-hmm. that like the tech community has found a new home for itself. Yeah. Right? Like, I am very pleased that there is something that people are excited about and are going ahead and using. Like, because it it, it would have been really sad for me if, like, people didn't want to be on Twitter anymore but had nowhere to go. And, like, mm-hmm. I'm happy that people have somewhere to go. I've just decided that I don't want to go to it right now. And like th- there are r- things that are helping me. Like I-, I don't feel like I need it so much because th- I use Discord so much now. Private Discords, public Discords, like that is like a is a much better place for me mm-hmm. and for what I'm looking for and the types of communication and conversations that I'm having. Also, what I didn't want to do from this is I don't want to make it that I've completely shut down any type of free feedback to me or the shows right that like mm-hmm. people can't send in questions to me anymore they can't send in like general follow-up and mm-hmm. so because you know a lot of that stuff can come in through our members discord but i didn't want to make that the only way that people could send stuff in so there is now on the Relay FM website there is a feedback button and people can get it from this show or they can go to cortexfeedback.com and they can send in questions so like ask cortex questions can come in that way for example so that's wow. in. That's on our website now. We built that. It goes into our own CMS. It's like a tool that we're building so we can collect follow-up and feedback. Oh, I didn't know that. Mm. We just put it live like a couple of weeks ago. It's it's an early version of what we will want this to be because as well, my co-founder Stephen has also left Twitter and is not, also not on Mastodon. So like, oh, I, oh, I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah. And so we're very much like, all right, we need to work something out because I was starting to realize that like, you know, submissions of questions and stuff mm. has always has been a thing on this show and many shows and I don't want it to be that the only way you can get in contact with us is to become a member like there's yeah. just something wrong about that so this is now like free open feedback form that anyone can put their info in and so far it's been live for a couple of weeks on some shows I'm very happy with this as a as a system it works great so I presume the, the format is the same for all the shows so it's relay.fm slash show name mm-hmm. slash feedback yeah is that like just a generic thing for all the shows that's a really good idea for the shows that have opted in it is an opt-in thing for each ah, show ah okay because right. not everyone okay, some people are just still very active on Mastodon so they don't need or want this and they want their stuff on Mastodon or Twitter or whatever but yeah this is something because as well what's great about this is not email so it's going into a specific place mm-hmm. uh, and it's character limited oh i see right so right. this is the type of way that i want my feedback for my shows and by like honestly so far like the feedback is high quality and good and helpful and like this is the kind of stuff that i want because as well it's like feedback i would get by email while too long even if someone was mad at me it was always better than a tweet yeah well uh, b- before you mentioned that you built this system for relay which i think is great i was going to say like this again the the concept of being out of touch or like the concept of not being able to get feedback which like emails existed for a really long yeah. time like that's totally a thing that you can do and there's a weird way in which Email, which used to be the low effort way to get in touch, has now become the higher effort way to get in touch compared to things like Twitter. And I do think even with like the feedback forms on Relay, I think there's a big advantage in putting up a very small but not zero hurdle Mm -hmm. for people to get in touch. And like when you say Twitter has changed and like changed the way that you felt about it over time. It's totally a function of just 
absolutely everybody has gone there and it, it's just such a such a low effort way to respond to people and so well yeah of course like it's a kind of selection effect if you massively increase the number of people who are there and also never increase the uh, difficulty of getting in touch with anyone well of, of course the average content is going to go down mm-hmm. I, I feel like th- this is this is the lesson that older me would try to impart on younger me when he just he just never considered the selection effect of like oh hey hey kid the internet seems like utopia because it's just a very small number of people who are here but like think through what's going to happen when everyone shows up and like really internalize what everyone means. It's like, it's not going to seem so great then. Uh, Like, you know, what, what happens with huge groups of people? And that's kind of like the Twitter effect. It's just as it's gotten larger and larger, the average quality has gone way down. So I'm hugely in favor of this kind of thing of, of like, you still want feedback from people who listen to your shows? Mm -hmm. Tell them like relay.fm slash cortex slash feedback. Like, that's a great place to send feedback. Or even better, is cortexfeedback.com. Goes to the same place. Cortexfeedback.com. Just a nice domain. Yeah, that is a nice domain. And that that's great. And it's just a little bit of hesitation where someone who just is having a bad day and, like, wants to be mean on Twitter can do that real easy when they just see you tweet anything mm-hmm. and they, they're on Twitter and it's, like, takes two seconds. Whereas this is more intentional. And I would expect that increases the quality of the positive and the negative feedback, like the negative feedback, kind of like you were just saying about how it's been higher quality negative feedback through email than compared to Twitter. So I don't don't see any kind of staying in touch problem at all, Mike. (laughs) We'll see. I mean, you are maybe not the right person to judge that. I am 100% the right person to judge this. I think I can make it work, right? Like, I believe I can handle my part, which is like, Mm -hmm. I think I can stay in touch. I can consume the information that I need to form the opinions that I want to be able to effectively create good content. Like, I am very confident in that. My only wonder is like is if it changes people's feelings or reactions to me and all my shows there you know but i am taking what i think is the best path for me and i am hoping that people will come along on that with that in mind of like just assume that maybe my opinions are based on the same information not on the fact that i'm not a mastodon you know what i mean yeah i i don't know like i'm I'm just I'm trying to express an idea here and I'm, I'm just sort of I'm kind of mentally flipping through the people I think have interesting opinions or write interesting things or say interesting things like who do you follow in the world and I'm trying to like plot this out on a graph of like interestingness versus connectedness and I feel like it's something like a bell curve slightly weighed towards the less connected side of things. So people who have absolutely no connection in a real way, not the like, oh, I'm not on Twitter kind of way in the, oh, I've, I've lived in a cabin for two years and haven't read anything in the last 10 years and I just have no idea what's going on. Like that tends to not be very interesting. And then as you increase connections, people can be interesting, but there's totally a diminishing returns and a rapidly diminishing turns for increased connectedness. And sort of like we were saying before, the most connected people, when I talk to them, feel the most like talking to chat GPT. Like, oh, you're not a person anymore. You're just like a reflection of all the things that you're connected to. And there's no one here because if you're just connected all the time, there's no space for you to develop anything. And so... It's kind of why like I frowned a little bit when you told me about the vibe check thing because in in my like I know this would never really happen but in like my fantasy world it's like I want to hear what my curly thinks about a thing before the vibe check. That's the most interesting moment. By and large that is the case. I'm not checking that a lot. And mm. see one of the things that I think I'm a little that, that like is a sticking point for me is I think quite a lot of things in tech I'm a, I could be a bit contrarian mm-hmm. and that's where I'm 
have a concern where people are going to forget that maybe I've always been that way. Mm -hmm. that then if I don't reference the thing that everyone's talking about, that must mean that the only reason I think differently to other people is because I'm not like up on the news, right? Yeah. I mean, here, here's the thing. You will get that kind of feedback for sure. Yeah. Uh, I know because I have publicly talked about being, you know, more disconnected than the average person. I totally get that feedback where yeah. people leave these comments of like, oh, Gray's so uninformed because he doesn't know anything. That's just a natural thing that's going to happen. Okay, so spoiler, that's why I have worried about this because I see these things too about you. <laughs> okay, so that so that's yes. the reason you're worried is uh-huh. that you see people like, oh, Gray doesn't know anything comments. Right. Since okay. Gray took his year away from the internet, he doesn't know what he's talking about anymore, right? Like I see these things. Yeah, but like... I mean, this is a this is a bigger conversation about negative feedback in general. <laughs> but my take on those comments is that they're they're almost always wrong. <laughs> like the person is just over assuming lack of knowledge on my part because of disagreement. Like that's really what's occurring. So they're they're running some kind of mental filter of like, oh, if they only knew more, they would agree with the opinion that I have, but they don't agree with my opinion. So that must mean they're lacking in information. I mean, again, my, my thoughts on negative feedback are just if you don't agree with it, it's like you, you can dismiss it relatively easily. The negative feedback that matters is the negative feedback that you agree with where you're like, oh, that person's right. But yeah, you are in a bit of a different position because you are in a place where you have to be talking about more current things on a much more frequent basis. Mm-hmm. But... The reality of the situation is you're still going to be connected to things. Mm -hmm. That's why you've set up the vibe check. That's why you've set up the RSS feeds. Again, my issue is not my feeling about how I am going to be. But but that's exactly like that's where I'm walking this through is like that's the reality. If anything, like, you know, in in my ideal world, I would I would reach through the computer and turn the dial down on your openness a little further. Mm -hmm. But, you know, but I, I totally understand why you don't want to do that. I'm not even suggesting that you should. That's just what I would do if I had the power. I expect I will. And like that mm-hmm. is my goal is to okay. not need that. And it's why like yeah. at the moment there's like 10 people in this folder. And so mm-hmm. like it's a handful of toots a day at most. And my hope is that because like, I'm keeping this in my mind because the idea I want to get rid of that because I, I don't particularly want it, but I'm seeing mm-hmm. if I need it. And at the moment, I don't. Yeah. Like, I want to get through a big Apple News cycle and see how I feel after that. I think that's great. That's actually really good to have a specific moment to think about. Like, a thing we can reevaluate at the end of the Mm -hmm. year in the theme section. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's that's, I'm actually really glad to hear that. But just to finish the thought is, so if you're doing this and you know that you are adequately in touch and then people are leaving comments, be like, uh... I can't believe Mike said the thing on the show. He's an out of touch fool. It's like, oh, but you know, that's not true. Like, you know, you read the things about whatever the topic is. Yeah, but you see, I think that's where me and you differ. Mm -hmm. And like part of why I needed to leave this part of social media is I frequently do not have that faith in myself. You ask me on any given day if I'm good at my job, I'll tell you I am. Mm -hmm. If you ask me on any given day, like what my skills are i believe i can tell you them and like mm-hmm. you know, i can tell you that i think i'm good at coming up with content and etc cetera, etc cetera. but if someone tells me you're bad at this you're bad at this you're bad at this and then you ask me that question i'm not going to give you the same answers right but this is part of that i have to be able to start from this place of like i believe i'm good at what i do straight up right that i don't mm-hmm. have to rely on other people's opinions to be able to form my own. Mm -hmm. The only way I can do this is I have to be able to start there. And I feel like now in 2023, I'm able to start there, but I am still susceptible to the down piece, which is the other part of why I can do it. Right. So like, I believe I can leave now because I'm good enough at what I do. Mm -hmm. I also want to leave now. So I don't have to be ground down. I I guess, I guess what I'm just trying to walk through here is the acknowledgement that comments about you being out of touch are inevitable 
and that's fine. In some ways, I look at that as a price for increased interestingness. That, that's why I was thinking about like this graph before. Uh, there's some there's some sweet spot about like turning down the dial and turning up the dial for like where where do you want to be if you do this kind of work? But ev- everything everything in life is a trade off, and this is one of those moments of like this is a trade off for a net positive increase in a bunch of things. It's a net positive increase in making yourself less chat GPT like when you talk about conversations. That's like a side effect of Uh decreasing connectedness. It's a net gain in decrease in random derailments, but you don't get net gains without some kind of negative. And I just feel like this negative is relatively minor because it is only a negative I don't quite want to say in perception, but I guess it's a negative from your perception that you just know that you have a harder time with those kinds of comments. Mm -hmm. So that's why I was just trying to say like, oh, but it's not true. Uh, And so you can kind of dismiss those sorts of comments if you know like, oh, no, but I did read up on that topic. Like I, I know more than this person thought I did. They're just assuming that I know nothing. That's sort of trying to express my thoughts on this. But like I'm, I'm, I'm very pro you doing this move. I just feel like you can't do anything on the internet when you are at any size of audience without having some people be really mad about it. (laughs) Of course, there's going to inevitably be negative feedback. You know, some of it, it hurts because it's accurate and it's like, ah, they got me in my secret heart. Like they knew uh, or like, yeah, that was that was real bad. But some of it is just like totally baseless and you you have to learn to mentally divide those two things as two fundamentally different kinds of things the negative feedback that is baseless or that you don't agree with and the negative feedback that you do agree with and they're just like they're almost like two unrelated categories and you have to kind of train yourself to think about them in that way yeah, and I think I have gotten better at this. Oh, for sure, for I mean, sure. You, you've known me for a long time, and you've seen a lot of change in me. But it's like that. I still like. I believe I am able to separate those things. Mm-hmm. But I haven't gotten to the point where they still don't make me annoyed, though. Yeah, and that may never go away mm-hmm. because that can just be a human reflex for, uh, like it's this kind of thing yeah. again, and. The annoyance can come from the fact of knowing, well, this will just be inevitable forever. (laughs) Now that you have spoken about leaving Twitter, it's like, oh, inevitably forever, there's going to be the mics out of touch comments. And that's just that's just a thing. That's just like a negative cost for all of the positive upside. Mm -hmm. But again, if it couldn't be more clear, number one. I am the best person to judge this. And I think it's a great decision. Number two, I think it's a great decision. Like, I'm glad to hear that you've done this. I hadn't really thought about the situation kind of giving you cover, but you're you're right. Like, it's perfect. Like, if you're going to do this, this is the lowest friction way to step away from Twitter. Like, I'm happy that you've taken advantage of the, shall we say, unique moment in Twitter's history and... Like this can be some real upside for you. And I'm also just really glad to hear that you, you know, you ha- you haven't played the migration game that everybody plays. Of like, oh, now we're all going to go over to this thing. That game never ends, which is why it's interesting to hear from you even just a little bit like, oh, Mastodon already intrinsically has the things that we can just set our watches and wait until the time when everybody decides that Mastodon is terrible and we're all going to go over to some other place. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, I'm I'm glad to hear that you're not having this in your life in any way and yeah rss it's great it's back. <laughs> it's back again who would have ever thought like 2023 is the year of rss but it totally is 